This is Patricia Window at the Cable Easel bringing you a live program devoted to painting and drawing from life. Tonight, you can call me and ask me questions about what I'm doing or what you're doing or whatever happens to cross your mind as far as painting is concerned. Uh, the number is 348-6800, I believe. <laughs> and um, I'm going to be painting from a monitor from a scene which was shot today. Uh, and that's the best that we can do about bringing a live program into the studio. So I think it's innovative. I don't think anybody else is doing that. Most people are working from either still photography or somebody else's paintings or from their imagination. I'm working from life. This is Gibbs Pond here in uh, the general area of Hopog Smithtown. And I believe that uh, anybody who knows this area will recognize it even though there's no greenery, no foliage, this is the winter time. But there is a charm about the simplicity of a winter time scene, which I think is captured right here in this, in this little study of Gibbs Pond. There are three elements about it, which I'll talk about as I go along. I'm gonna be working in palette knife tonight uh, on a prepared canvas, I mean a canvas that has been prepared and made gray for the reasons of television transmission. And I'm going to be, st I'm gonna lay it out um, with my, what I call my tinted turpentine. And that's merely a great, uh, a, a liner brush, which has been soaked in turpentine and tinted with black color for me to lay it out. There has to be drawing. Uh, there is no, uh, nothing to s tell me that you could ever start any kind of a, of a visual, uh, uh, subject matter without having some drawing. And I find that, in, o in other words, the plan. Everything needs a plan. I'm going to give you the horizon line first. Uh, presumably this is um, within about a little bit north, a little bit uh, above center. And that is going to be the point of departure of my going into the details of this picture. So we now have a one-line composition, sky and land. In the meantime, there are things that interrupt it. Uh, plans are what I think uh, I'd like to talk about only briefly when you start to do landscapes because when you work from life, it's easier. Even though it's bloody cold outside and even though in the winter time one doesn't feel like going out, you can still do it. You can get a sketch and uh, do a pencil drawing with maybe not even more than five lines. Let's see if I can do a five line layout of this particular scene from the monitor and then we'll get some idea of whether or not any of this is possible. Let us assume that this line is the top of the grasses. This lower line is how thick the grasses are. This is called a horizontal composition, obviously, because everything is horizontal. Oh, we have two lines. Then we've got the general layout of the back, of the foliage in the back, with a larger and higher composition of trees in the center. And then there are houses in the background. But for the most part, this is the general layout of this particular background. There is a mirror image, of course, in the fact that this is water. And so the mirror image is arbitrarily this kind of a layout. I think that anybody can, who, who, can, who can tell top from bottom can tell that this is the way you would lay out a mirror image of the scene. Um, then comes the, inter the, the interruption of the uh, little land masses. Over here on the, uh, on the uh, left side of the canvas is a little landmass, which fortunately is covered in snow. 
because that's the time of year it is. Uh, and then we have this nice diagonal in the foreground with what uh, presumably is called some kind beach area. The, the lines are one, two, three, four, five, five lines, and the sixth one is the mirror image. That's not much to ask. If you have a blank piece of paper and a pencil, you can do a five-line composition in the car, less than 30 seconds, and then you can think about the plan for a landscape painting. I'm going to be using a material which is called MG Quick Drying White. It uh, is put out by the Grumbacher Company. It is indeed very quick drying. It is a matter of possibly 20 minutes to a half an hour for this to dry. And so, even though it's oils, it is reminiscent a little bit of the way in which you handle acrylics because they dry very quickly. However, there is a great deal more permanence about oils, and that's why I like to work in them because I know that oils are going to last. The, acryl the acrylics, they're not, they have not had long enough to experiment with them. So, uh, even though they've been here 25 years, but I'm talking about three and 400 years of oil uh, information of how long oils last, and it's, it's way, way in the hundreds of years. So anyway, that's what I'm interested in, longevity. Uh, behind me is an oil painting that I did um, uh, just last, last summer. It's, uh, a, uh, it's a done from life. It's a composition of an enormous iris and two smaller ones in the foreground. It is semi-surrealistic in concept, but it is from life. The fact that there is a huge one and smaller ones that are still even over oversized makes it slightly surrealistic. So, uh, when I talk about working from life, I apply it also to something such as a different approach, but it's all the basis is working from life. I believe that if the monitor were to come on now, you would see some ducks in the foreground that weren't there before. There are some ducks that have come uh, to, to, to roost there on the shoreline, which means that um, we are, in fact, working from life. Electronic as it may seem, it is still from life. Well, to apply paint to canvas, here is the problem. And here is the reason that we have this program, and hopefully you will find some reason to call, ask some questions, good, bad, indifferent, silly, or bright. It doesn't matter as long as we can, uh, you know, let you know that once a month I come here on the last Tuesday of every month and I come into the studio and I work live for the purpose of not only contact but hopefully disseminating some information which you might find useful. I'm mixing up some ultramarine blue, some of the white, a touch of manganese, which I mentioned at another show. There's um, now nine and a half dollars a tube, so be sure that you <laughs> are prepared for some something of a shock when you go to the art store in case you want manganese blue. The other ones are not that expensive. I don't know what they've got in this blue that makes it that costly, but nevertheless, that's what it is. All right, applying paint to canvas. I like to keep it simple. I like to keep it um, very, very simple. Uh, my uh, my uh, real uh, concern is that when a knife is introduced, then maybe technique seems to be taking a holiday, and that's, uh, that is not the way it is at all. As a matter of fact, a much more concerned technique has to be employed when you are, appeal when you are applying paint with a knife. Uh, as you can see, I'm using a rather small knife, and the direction of the, of the, um, of the strokes at this time does not matter. It's only when you want a certain uh, horizontal effect that you would use a horizontal uh, application with this knife. Knives, uh, I I as far as uh, palette knives are concerned, is a wonderful medium because of many many sort of hidden and possibly unknown and, and uh, simplistic reasons. But the fact that you can have this knife and I will show you on a close-up how you clean this knife and how you certainly can never get into trouble with mixing unwanted colors as you do sometimes with a brush. This is what happens when you want to have a clean uh, knife to work with. All you do is to wipe it once or twice and you've got it clean enough to be able to see the reflection of the um, of the lights. So you can't get a brush that clean. No matter. There's no way that you can get a brush as clean as that. That means that you are assured of clean and uh, clear 
unadulterated colors when you're working with a palette knife. Uh, I've now used up uh, the majority of this, uh, of this white, so I'm, I'm squeezing some more out on my palette. And white is the basis of most painting, and that's why it's bought in these large tubes. Um, once again, I'm going to be mixing and getting as close as I can, having remembered what I put into the color beforehand. However, do not ever think that you can uh, um, make a mottled and blotchy uh, look on a palette knife painting. It is a no-no. It is the sign of the rankest amateur if it's all blotchy uh, and, and, and if these and nasty little uh, puddles of color are darker than the others. To me, you have to be absolutely pure with the way you apply these colors. Later, when you want to start mixing and making it blotchy, it has to be very purposeful and very um, deliberate. So when, I'm, when I put on these, this, uh, this heavy color, the reason that I'm using the quick drying white is that uh, and it's, it, its quality has not been altered by adding the dryers. As a matter of fact, um, it, it, it becomes much more heavy impasto. Impasto is, means when you have a texture to the paint, whereby it, it's not a smoothed out brush technique, which is um, a, an entirely different style. Uh, so. A, pa a knife technique is, is preferred by a lot of people because of the sort of tactile response that you can get from the, um, from the thickness of the color and the fact that you do feel a tremendous texture. Well, this is about as simple as you can apply a color uh, for a background. It looks as though it's oversimplified. I'm going to lighten a little bit of the horizon back here because that's atmosphere, even though it was a brilliantly clear day. I believe this was shot yesterday, so I'm wrong about today. It was shot yesterday when the sun was very, very bright. And so I'm going to add just a touch of um, cadmium orange to this white and uh, apply it uh, on, the, uh, on the lower part of the skyline. It may be a little bit subtle, for the television monitor to pick up, but I doubt it. And let's see if I can show you, that's all right, and see if I can show you the way you apply it, apply the color over the other one and try to get some of the, some of the um, texture to it, which means that uh, the desire to have an absolutely smooth painting is non-existent in this technique. But there is a wonderful feeling about these paintings. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people prefer my palette knife paintings to, my, uh, to, to the other ones that are so smoothly rendered, such as the uh, flowers behind me here. So uh, dealing with this, and of course the background naturally is the one that goes on first. Uh, that, is a, that is an absolute given uh, for most people who have painted. They know you know that you don't put the background in last or even uh, afterwards, you put it in first. Uh, even the painters that are putting in colors with very wide brushes um, put the backgrounds in first. But don't forget, call me at 348-6800 if you have any questions about what I'm doing, if you're, of in if you're interested in this at all, and we can, we can chat together. Uh, so I, before, that, before any of that happens, I'm going to continue now and show you um, that I'm going to now start working to, towards the foreground, meaning that I'm going to start to apply color for the background. Now, everything at this time of year is extremely subdued. There are no greens, there are no golds, uh, there are no pale yellows in any of the foliage. The foliage is sort of nothing color, which means that you have to know how to mix a nothing color. Well, nothing colors come from mixing earth reds and blues. You get a dark tone, which is, uh, well, it can be anything you want, but it should tend to be in the smoky green grays. Uh, and here is uh, the um, manner in which I'm going to start to put these trees. It's a very light touch. You don't dig in with this. I've got a brush full of color as you can, uh, brush. I've got a knife full of color as you can see here. And I'm going to apply it. It's an interpretation. Palette knife is interpretive painting. So I'm going to barely touch the canvas, and whatever little touches that I give are going to be the interpretation of what I see in the background there. Some of the green is taking on the blue, and some of it is not. But for the most part, it is the impression. Impressionism is what we're dealing with. A lot of people hate it, but there is something to be learned from it. You learn 
simplification, which is very important in landscape painting because uh, the minute you can begin to isolate and simplify, you become a better landscape painter. You begin to eliminate the unnecessary details. And uh, these kind of uh, uh, purposeful accidents that take place, such as what happens when you're doing this in the background, is what I would call a far more painterly technique than when you are um, uh, diligently putting in every leaf. I believe that when the uh, program is over this evening, you'll see that the, the stand back effect of this kind of painting has a, has a merit all its own. But the color selections and the fact that you keep it extremely simple is the point of this kind of painting. Uh, I do it because, uh, first of all, I sometimes spend many, many months doing only palette knife paintings and then go back to my, uh, to my other style, which is, um, which is brush painting, and that's really a different, uh, really a very different approach. So I'm, 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 um, Mixing some more color. You don't, you don't mix great go gobs of color all at once. You mix it a little bit as you go along. And here, and here is another, here, let, let, this is another, gonna be another time when I barely touch the canvas with this uh, brush full of color and I get an effect of being able to see through branches off into the distance. And I can, in fact, use some verticals, but that, that, this, this is too far away to have that matter. So here is another little break in the trees. And in the background here, there are houses which are barely visible. And therefore, I'm not going to put them in because if I have to strain to see them, that's not the point of this, uh, of this painting. You have to be able to eliminate what is really not obvious. And the palette knife allows you to do that. Uh, I've got a, I've got, uh, it's very subtle change here and I'm afraid that possibly it isn't being picked up by the, um, by the monitor, but there is, a, uh, there is a slight difference between these two greens. The one I'm putting on now is much darker than the one I put on before. Now this clump of trees in the middle, oh, let me prepare something here because one can see, um, one can see something in the background there that the trees are going to be going over. And it's, it appears to be a kind of a roof line. So let me just put in here the suggestion of a, of a roof line and a house that's behind these clump of trees. But if, if it's obvious enough, obvious enough for me to be able to see through the trees, it's obvious enough to pay attention to. And I think that you'll find that it's, uh, it's, it's quite mysterious when this sort of thing uh, comes along and you're working from life and all of a sudden you see something that you didn't see before and, that, and then you can put it in. And this can happen if you work out of your imagination or out of your recall because I think that people with instant and infallible recall are not only rare but probably non-existent. Um, people who say they have instant and infallible recall, uh, I, don't think, um, I don't think really really do. Anyway, and so these houses in the background here that are on the other side of the pond are giving us a feeling of human habitation, as it were, and giving you the um, ability to introduce um, some other shapes instead of just the trees in the background. Okay, so we have a call and let's take it as, uh, as I continue to paint. Hello there, tell me please who you are. Hello, my name is Amy. Hello, Amy. How are you doing? Fine. I'd like to say I like your show. Thank you. Um, I'm a high school art major, yes. and yet I've worked in a lot of medias, but I've never worked in oils before uh -huh. because, you know, they're too expensive for the school. Yeah. Um, what would be, let's say, an oil painter's starter kit? What would I need to learn the basics of oil painting, uh, you know, the canvases, um, what kind of brushes, um, what you consider the best brand of paint? Okay. Amy, I have a prepared sheet. Uh, a page in a letter form to people who have asked me this question. And if you will give the operator uh, on the phone where you are your name and your address, I, they'll give it to me and I will send you exactly what you're looking for. Okay, thank you very much. I don't have to, I, I, I won't go over the list now because it would just take too long, but I have prepared it because I get the question very often. Okay. I appreciate your call, Amy, and I wish you best of luck and keep in touch with me. Thank you very much. Right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, yeah, the, um, the uh, <clears throat> problems of how you start, of course, the kits that they put out uh, presumably are extremely well uh, thought out, but they're not, in my opinion, so I have my own ideas about it. I think there's another call. Oh, good. Let's take the other call. Hello there, and who are you, please? Hi, how you doing? My name is Larry. Hi, Larry. How are you doing? Fine. I've been watching your show for some time now. And, yes. Uh, I like 
your particular techniques, the way you work. Good. Um, I was wondering, uh, what particular paint medium do you use? Uh, do you mix a certain medium? Do you make your own? Ah, uh, okay. When I paint with a brush, I use a medium which is called Marage. Marage. Huh? Yeah, it is. Uh, it was invented by a Frenchman, a certain Mr. Claude Marage, and it is made in this country in very, very few places. I see. That's the only medium that I really use when I'm painting, uh, when I'm doing brush painting. You watch some of the brush painting shows? Yes, I do. I particularly watched um, a repeat that was on here some time back, um, and you had had a painting in the foreground of a series you were doing called Beauty and the Beast. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering, how are you able to pick up that even set of strokes, you know, without, you know, having any brush strokes show? Ah, well, the brush strokes do show. That's the problem with television. You don't see the brush strokes, mm -hmm. but they do show. I believe I have that painting here this evening. Uh, I mean, I have another painting of an animal this evening with hair and so on and so on. No, I use, I simply, the, it's, it's just my technique. Um, it's the technique, uh, Larry. Uh, I can't tell you any more than that. Uh, the, um, there is a painting, oh, well, it's in the studio here somewhere. If we take a break, I'll fetch it and, and, and bring it back so that you can look at it, and then I'll maybe talk about how I get that. But it's, it's really nothing more than my technique. I, mean, I, I shouldn't say nothing more. Do you paint, Larry? Yes, uh, I've been trying to make a career out of illustrating. Good for you. And, uh, tough, tough. I've been, working, I've been working with oils for some, not too long, not basically too long. I've been working on other mediums, pen and ink, watercolor, and uh, basically I'm trying to get a career out of doing that, you know. Yeah. And are you working out of Long Island? Yeah, I live right in Bayshore. Okay, right. and, and what do you do? Take your portfolio around? Yes, right now I've been working on a series of portfolios, and I figured I was going to take them around certain magazines and uh, book publishers for jacket covers and so forth. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I'd love to talk about this business and my technique, but uh, let me just take one moment and tell you about your portfolio. All right. Oh, good. Somebody has brought me my tiger. This Is this the one you're talking about, Beauty and the Beast? Is this the tiger that you mean? Uh, it, it looks something like it. It had a... It had flowers? It had flowers? It was quite larger. Yeah, I cut them. I cut the flowers off and I've saved... I saved... Yes, this is it. Yes, okay. this is it. Okay. Well, this is, uh, this is all done only with a brush. You can only do this with a brush. You can't do this with a palette knife. And it's done with a medium, uh, with the Marage medium, and um, it's just a question of technique. I see. I see. You can see that the blends are very, very smooth here, and then when you get further down to the moustache, then it's single line, single stroke lines with uh, uh, something called a liner brush. And there, yeah. So, so it's a question of technique, Larry. What can I tell you? Um, I know, uh, I've been working with particular mediums. I've been trying out a particular medium called liquid. Oh yes, yes. I saw it yesterday at Pearl Paint. Which, uh, yeah, I go there shopping. All Do you the time. like uh, that liquid? Yeah, it seems to work best for me. Uh, yeah. It's, it's very good, basically. You know. Good. Well, I've been experimenting with other kinds. I wanted yeah. to see about trying to find something that would work best for me. Yeah. Right. And. Uh, I've been trying using turpentine and... Yeah, yeah. Use, the, use as little of that as possible. Yes. Yeah. Well, just before we, before we say goodbye, one word about your portfolio. Make sure that your portfolio has top A number one super quality to it and not too big. The oh. people who look at your portfolio want to be able to get the picture of what you do in a matter of instants. Mm. So don't clobber it full of uh, mediocre stuff that you have to explain. Just give them top number one quality stuff and make it short and sweet. Straightforward. Huh? Straightforward. Straightforward and little, a little bit, but the best. A little bit, but the best. All right. <laughs> I've gone through the portfolio thing my whole life, and it's just, it just a little bit of things that I've learned along the way. Yes. All right. Thanks for calling, Larry. Right, thank you. Wish you luck and keep in touch. I will. Fine. All right, bye-bye. Ah, oh, yes, the courage of the artist um, with a portfolio. I must say that um, my heart goes out to the people who are doing it. But we can't survive without them, because every time you look at anything, there has been an artist behind it. Here's another call. And while I'm working, I hope nobody thinks I'm rude if I keep working when I'm talking, but uh, this is a visual show, and it's much more interesting to see me do something than to see me talk. Um, tell me who you are. Uh, good evening, Pat. This is Kenny from Sable. Yes, Kenny. Uh, it's not rude at all. It's just great to watch it. Ah, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, What's on your mind? Oh, a month or so ago, I started a wet-on-wet -wet technique painting. Yeah. And I never actually got to finish the painting. Yeah. And I was wondering how I'd start back up on it. 
I can't tell you that, uh, Kenny. I have absolutely no idea of what this wet-on-wet -wet technique is talking about. Uh, I find that it's an aberration in itself. And if you, and, and I suppose the best thing that I would do would be to guess uh, how to start it over again, and that is to um, get a transparentizer. Mm -hmm. Something, I believe there is, uh, there is a, there is a liquid called a transparentizer. It's probably a base of some sort of turpentine or varnish. And I suppose wet that picture again with that and then continue whatever you started doing. Okay, thanks a lot. You're and, welcome. Uh, continue to paint on the air. It's really great. Oh, thanks for calling, and I'm glad you like it. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, so, I'm, I'm working with the knife. I did not introduce the small brush, which I, which I could have done, but I think that being a purist and talking about the knife technique is better. And so, when you're, when you're dealing in the wintertime, you have to use, uh, you have to comply with what conditions are out there. And the conditions are that there are tens of thousands of millions of billions of little tiny twigs that are forming a kind of a silhouette against the sky. It's best done deliberately, not with this technique, it's a, just deliberately little lines as best you can, very light technique of, of putting this paint on, and hopefully um, to get some feeling of what it is when all of these uh, uh, these little uh, lacy things are silhouetted against the sky. I find that um, that's one of the things about winter paintings which I find such um, so, so, so really romantic in a way. These little, these little lacy things silhouetted against the sky really get to me. So uh, I must say that that's a confession of mine. And so here we have a feeling that in the background with just three colors, well, four with that pale blue, the blue, this um, misty kind of dark nothing type of green, and then the white trees in the back, uh, the white houses uh, kind of in the background, giving you some feeling that there is something going on back there. And presumably, that has occupied the, f the, the one, one part of the background, or the, the far background, of this painting, which has bands. One, two, three, four, five, maybe six bands, really, that you could call ribbons of color. I've just not cleaned my brush, as you can see, having applied all this dark color. This brush, why did I say brush? It's actually the knife. I've cleaned the knife, and it's as pristine as it was when it was first bought, which means that the next color you're going to mix can't possibly be messed up with anything that might be left on it because there's nothing left on it. Not so with a brush. A brush is always uh, tripping you up and doing, giving you a bad time with getting full of paint and impossible to clean. Of course, means that you have to change brushes. With this, this is really cheap. You buy one of these and you use one knife for the entire technique, and this knife is probably $4, as opposed to $6 for the smallest brush you can buy. So here I am going again with my, um, my economy, uh, trying to help us all along and give you some idea that even though it's expensive, there are ways to be able to overcome it. I'm mixing some uh, this is called Indian yellow. It's a wonderful, vibrant color. It's not lemon yellow. It isn't cadmium. It isn't middle. It's, it's, it's Indian yellow. And when you go to the store, it's on my list of colors that I'm going to send to Amy. This is a beautiful, vibrant yellow. And I'm going to enhance what I see back there purely uh, for your information. It, to keep it as subdued as it is in this winter time, may may be cheating. Well, I am not going to enhance it that much. That's something that my business of working from life simply cannot abide to, to go that far afield of what I'm seeing. So I am going to darken it with some yellow ochre and a touch of Indian red. And here is the background uh, of, the, of that, um, apparently, it's uh, leftover marsh grasses from the, um, from the summer that have turned amber colored in the uh, in this time of year, and it's uh, it's up against the um, it's it's butting right up against the dark uh, land mass of trees in the background, and just going across with small deliberate strokes. The water is not done this way. I daub away at these smaller details, but when we get down towards the foreground, you'll find that I change my uh, my style of applying the paint because it requires a different movement. And here is um, that lovely golden band running across the um, across the middle ground of this picture. I'm now going to add a great deal of the white, and I'm going to run it across because it's lighter underneath than it is on the top. Apparently, the blossoms on that beach grass are turn darkish. 
well, a little bit darker, a little bit more amber, a little bit more vibrant than the lower ones that have really been totally desiccated by the winter. So when you, when you, look, at, when you look at a landscape and you say to yourself, why is that color like that? You begin to sort of learn things that you never really bothered to think about before, namely, what, it is, what is it that happens to these grasses when they die or when they freeze or when they get cold or when they are, you know, in, in a dormant period. So, so I, I kind of wax a little scientific when I do these things because I, simp I always ask the question, why does that, why has that assumed that color when I know perfectly well that five months ago it was pale green? So um, you'll, you kind of, um, you kind of play the game of uh, deducing and analyzing. I believe there's another call, so let's take it. Hello there, who are you, please? Yes? Hello? Something funny with this uh, thing. Hello, are you there? Oh, we've lost them. Well, maybe they'll try again. Um, because sometimes the, um, sometimes the telephone thing goes funny. Uh, that's all right, we can, we can wait. All right, there is now the second band of color. The third, rather, the blue, the dark, and the pale. Working down towards the middle ground, I'm now going to take some Indian red and a little bit of this darkish pale, this darkish green that I used for the background, and I'm going to run a kind of, um, of an interpretive line across here to, uh, because it does get dark towards the water. And as you can see with palette knife, you can sometimes rely very heavily on some of the well, they're not accidents, but they're sort of happenings that take place when the, when the um, paint is applied with, with a knife that you would have to work at with a brush. The, um, the spontaneity of the knife is some of the things that, that appeal to people and make people feel very, very comfortable with it. Yes, I have another call, so let's do that. Hello there. Uh, hello, Pat. Yes. Uh, this is Joan. I was calling to find out, have you ever used the oil paints that you mix with water, uh, something new out by one of the old companies. Oh, I have never heard of it until this minute. How uh, fascinating. Tell me more about it. Well, I don't know if I could say the brand name on the air. Oh, sure. Go ahead. What do we care? Okay. These are the new Pelican oil colors you just mix with water. How absolutely extraordinary. That's, that's against all scientific... <laughs> Yes. Uh, they said it dries in about two hours to the touch, and you could use uh, the blending the same as the oil paints. And I don't know if you had used them yet or not. I have not used them because I have not have heard of them. This um, I, I must find out more about it because the uh, it, it defies all the laws of oil and water don't mix, right? Yes, I, I thought they may be something like the Alkit paints, oh. but I think they're, they're mixed with uh, oils. Of course they are. Uh, I guess maybe I should just try them. I bought a new set, and I figured I would try them, and maybe I'll get called, back to you and let you know how they work. Of course, it's called Pelican? Yes. It's the Pelican people putting it out. Yes, Pelican Paint Company. Well, that's a new one on me. I appreciate your call. Uh, yes, I just picked them up in um, one of the stores in East Hempstead, one of the big paint stores. Is it? Did you go to Pearl? Yes. Okay, well, that's where most people go who have any desire to buy color. So, that's wonderful. Your name again? Joan. Joan Miller. Okay. Well, Joan, I couldn't be more glad of, of your call. I think that's, uh, you know, whenever you learn, you learn something new, it's, uh, it's a plus. So, uh, you get them and you call me back a, a month from tonight and tell me what it, what, what, what's happening. Okay, I will. And thank you. I really enjoy your show. Thank you for calling. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Oh wow! Oil and water do mix. My my, how extraordinary! That would be uh, that would be rather an innovation for people who are allergic to turpentine and who don't like the smell of oil and everything. If you can mix it with water and still get the feeling of oils, I guess you've, I guess you've gotten pretty good. All right, I've um, I've started to work with this reflection here, and. Uh, I mean, the reflection of the grasses obviously is directly below the grass, and uh, then we're going to start to, uh, I'm going to start to move into the, uh, into this mirror image, which is the pattern that I, that I put down before, to see whether or not I can pull off, pull it off, and it's, uh, it's qu quite a problem to try and get the, um, 
to try and get the feeling that this is actually reflected in the water. That's the whole point of doing this. I'm going to take a break for just a moment, not for any mysterious reason. I'm not going to pull any magic tricks. It's just that we need to take a break for a moment, so don't go away. I'll be right back. back again and I believe there's a patient somebody on the telephone so let's take that call hello there who are you please uh, my name's Michelle hi Michelle yeah hi uh, I was just curious the uh, phone call just before mine um, the one was talking about that new paint yes and I'm really interested in that because like I said I'm allergic to turpentine wow you you so you're one of those that would really benefit from this yeah you know because I tried acrylics yes and the blending can be a real pain and that's another reason I'd like to ask you um, I had trouble using the knife I find that I get gloves and I you know you know when they get gets too much in one spot how do you repair it without making it too much smear or turn into mud uh, lift it off I, I tried that but then it's hard to go back in that one spot I don't know see how light you're doing that yeah and if you blob it uh, don't blob it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That's my problem. Uh, well, it, it, it comes with technique. What did you say your name was, Amy? Michelle. Oh, Michelle. Um, it comes with technique. And, you know, just because you blob once doesn't mean that you are committed to blob forever. Yeah. And if you use too much, then you must remember what it was that made it blob, and then you will eventually stop blobbing it. Well, when you scrape the palette, do you use just the side? Oh, yeah. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Shall I show you? Yeah, let me see. <laughs> well, all right. Here's let, let a close up on this palette will show you that I can that I can remove I can remove a tremendous amount of color. See, it's building up on this. Yeah. So, so I mean, the the side of the knife is exactly what you uh, is what you use to remove blobs from the canvas. Oh, okay. All right, I'll I'll remove some blobs from the canvas in a minute and show it to you. As, and I know that you'll stay tuned. Oh yeah. Because the great uh, glob removal is about to happen. And so, uh, I must say that if you are if you are having problems with globs, that's uh, you want globs. That's why you're working with a knife. Yeah. yeah. Uh, however, you know they can get out of hand. There's no doubt about that. And so, so um, uh, you know, I mean, it's just uh, learn by your mistakes. If you know you're globbing, figure out why you did that. And if you don't like it, then just don't do it again. Yeah, well, I, you know, I try to do it very even. That's my problem. I guess I just want it too even. Yeah, you know, this is not the technique. You do not want it even if you are working in this technique. You want it to be painterly and you want it to have texture. Yeah. So if you want to paint it even, then, uh, you, you know, uh, go and um, get, get some brushes and don't work with a knife. Yeah, I've, I've always used brushes and then I just started trying to use the knife. Yeah, but it's fun, isn't it? It is. It okay. really is. I do more laughing than anything because I'm scraping those blobs off. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, as long as you're learning on your own, that's my advice. Uh, there is nowhere that you're going to be able to find out how to do this knife technique. I don't believe that it's taught even at the Art Students League. Well, I really started painting after I've watched her show. Oh, good for you. I never, my brother is an artist, and I said, gee, I wish I can draw. And then I saw you. Yep. 
and I went out and got easel, and I started drawing, and I just started painting like you. Well, that's the, what's why we're doing this show, to get converts like oh, you. Oh, it is. It's, your show is absolutely the best. Oh. <laughs> uh, I well. really, I, I have my neighbors, and they don't paint, but I called up because one time you were painting the top of the steeple of their church. Uh -huh. And I called them to watch it, and now they watch your show. Well, you see, that's what makes this whole thing really wonderful and worthwhile. I find myself uh, almost emotionally overcome when I hear you say that, because, you know, you often wonder, is anybody out there watching? Oh, well, my neighbors are. Is there anybody out there in the fog? <laughs> you know, you wonder. Yeah, the but we're, we're good out for here, you. and we really, really enjoy your show. Well, we missed you when you weren't off for a while, but I watched all the repeats. Ah, uh, fine. Well, I, you know, I had to go to Europe, you know, I'm... I mean, gee whiz, fellas. Um, well, hey, good. <laughs> hey, what the heck? You go and paint Corsica and you come back changed. Oh, that must have been fantastic. Oh, yeah, man. I don't know why Napoleon wanted to leave that place. It's pretty neat. Well, I have an uncle who, who uh, lived in, pa in um, a small town in France and he painted. Good. Well, I so. tell you, uh, I'm glad to hear that you're doing it. Keep in touch. Uh, and, oh, I will. And let me know how you're... Uh, yeah, uh, I practice with the knife. Fine, yes, do that. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, I'm working on this Reflections, but I've got to use a different style because otherwise it's just going to be a mirror image. And by that I mean I'm going to start to pull this across. And I think that it would be a good idea if I were to just pull it across very slowly to give you some idea of how you must rely on some of these accidents that are going to happen when you do this. There's some color that is getting pale there and then you don't have to, you can't be afraid, you have to keep going. And as you, as you keep going you will find that the color changes. But that's the point of trying to get this to be an interpretation, not an actual rendering, which is what you would get from a camera or what you would get from a pencil drawing, but it's an interpretation of what you're seeing and the literal renderings are, are not the call of the day here. This is what you call genuinely impressionistic painting. It's what uh, sent the, uh, the French uh, people over the edge as far as uh, painting was concerned when the impressionism hit France at the turn of the century and after and prior to the Second World War, uh, the, uh, the school of Impressionism began to flourish because there is a certain excitement in being able to interpret something that you see. It happened in music and it happened in, in, uh, in dance and it happened in theater. And so it's all got to, you know, all of these artistic disciplines have the same kind of reaction to reaction, and the uh, the reaction that um, was caused by the Impressionists was global. Uh, I mean, it even got as far as the Orient. But um, so when you get when you can see on a technique such as this, this is a mirror image, but it's different because it's in the water, and the um, the um, desire to make things to give an impression of what it is is what makes the whole makes the whole technique uh, so fascinating. Uh, when, you, uh, when you think about the... Um, so I'm going I'm to pull this across again, and I'm going to pull it across the area which has the dark, and I'm going to lift it just a little bit so that the dark, remain, dark remains through it, but so that you get some of that, some of that brilliant blue on it. And uh, when you, this comes from experimenting, hating it, thinking that you're, you must be out of your mind to sit here doing this, and then after a while you'll find that the technique begins to make some, begins to make some sense and you begin to understand just what it is that these, these um, sort of semi-intentional accidents can do for you. Um, unfortunately, there's never enough time for me to be able to go into these things uh, in, in greater depth, but I hope that what I, what, what I do is able to, to do a little bit of clarifying on what I'm talking about. Uh, one of the things to remember is do not allow paint to has, that has not been properly mixed to, to, to get onto the canvas. Mix it all thoroughly beforehand. Mix this color thoroughly, and the only time that colors are going to, uh, going to mix is when they layer. It's, this is layered painting. And when I, when I, when I, oh darn, when I, uh, you have to get plenty of paint, you have to, you can't be stingy with this. You have to know that a lot of paint is needed to, to produce these effects. And pulling it across like this, and it's getting paler as it gets uh, towards the shore. 
Yeah, sometimes I have to stop talking when I'm concentrating. I cannot be a magpie all the time. Uh, do, do call me if you, think I'm, if you think I'm messing this up. Call me up and tell me about it, because I'm out here all by myself uh, uh, doing something which, is, uh, which appears to be easy, but is actually quite disciplined and sometimes, um, sometimes does not work. I want, to, uh, I want to be able to uh, get to the business of getting the ducks. Now, here's another way that I'm going to pull this across here. This is another layer of color that um, is, I'm, I'm putting this on and hoping that, the, um, hoping that what I'm talking about will become evident to you as I pull this across. And you can see, the, you can see how, you're, how you should be willing to let things lie when you do it. Okay, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just hang on for a minute and, and see. There we are. Um, See, I'm working not only from my monitor, but from your monitor to see whether or not th any of this is getting across. Uh, don't breathe and don't answer the phone and don't talk. There you go. Anyway, as you can see, there is a certain concentration that is definitely in order. Um, I'm going to mix uh, um, a lot more. Let me see. I have a watch here that should be able to tell me that it's, oh my, we're, we're running out of time as usual. So anybody who has a call better get it in because I think we're about nine minutes away from the end of the show. Here's another pulling across here to try and get the, to try and get the look of, of the water and the, and it's, and, and the strange things that happen to it. Even when it's semi-frozen, as this little pond was yesterday, there is a certain, there's still certain movements that take place in the water and on the surface w when light hits it. Okay. Let me see, there's a, there's a, this, I have, oh, 12, good, okay, I've got all sorts of people some gesticulating numbers to me, fingers in the air telling me how many minutes are left, and that's very helpful because my watch is never right. Um, so, uh, as you can see, there are different blues at work here. Uh, the, um, let, me, let me get, before, before the, uh, that swan is really, I think, posing. I do believe that, this, that that swan has something on its mind and it's posing, so I'm going to get to the swan. And of course, because this is interpretive and I'm, an impre and I'm being an impressionist, I'm going to use pure white. I'm going to pay no attention to the fact that there may be some shadow in this. I'm going to use pure white. Here's a knife full of pure white, and I'm going to try to get the general pattern of that bird in just a few strokes and see if I can, if I can, inter oh, he's turning around. Well, see, I've got to wait for him. Now, all right. Here's at least his body, and then I'll get his neck the other way. His body is shaped something like this. It kind of, this is where I'm going to become literal. I'm not going to use just a blob. I'm going to become a little bit more literal. So this this is the general shape that I see, and somehow his tail is causing a little triangle here, which makes me realize that even if it's this, uh, even if it's this interpretive, it still has to have make some sense. So his little tail seems to be there, and now is now the neck. Well, I believe that the neck is, uh, he'll come back, but let me see if I can just get on, because we don't have that much time to fool around and wait for that swan to do what I want him to do. You, will, you would apply the paint rather heavy, because you're fooling around on top of the blue, and I would, sup I would think that the simpler you keep it, the better. Now, this swan may not appreciate what I'm doing to him. Oh, God, there, there he is. See, all things come to him who waits. Um, well... We'll probably get back to that. Uh, no, I don't like it. I'm going to take this out. Okay, good thing when you ha when you make when you have something that you want to change, you have to know how to change it. I'm going to make that swan go in the other direction. Uh, I'm going to make him do this. All right, he can't. It comes down rather smoothly here. Oh, I'd have to be. And we've gotten rid of the little triangle of his of his uh, tail, and there he is in profile. Okay, when you get away from it, it looks better. And he does have that characteristic turn up of the tail in the back. Well, what can I tell you? A touch of orange will complete it because I am, after all, a realist. And there is the, there's his orange bill. We have a call. Okay, we got away from the swan with a phone call. Good. Uh, tell me who you are, please. My name is Carmen. Hello, Carmen. I am not a painter, but I enjoy your show. Just so you know, we're here watching you. Good. But you're not alone there. <laughs> 
I enjoy it so much, and hopefully in my old age, I can get to it. Well, this is the time to do it, Carmen. <laughs> Don't wait till you're old. You probably won't have the energy. The energy and the fingers, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, if you if you love to watch it, you should certainly take the plunge. I really do, and I, I, I am learning a lot from you. Good. Yeah. Okay, take care. Well, thanks for calling. You're I'm going to get that flock of birds in before two, uh, a tremendous amount of birds suddenly, yes. suddenly appeared. My God, there's one landing on the... Oh, isn't that cooperative? Well, anyway, there he is. I'll just put him in. And you can see when a painter is outside, he's got to work fast. That one just landed on the water, but there's a, there's a whole group of them flying about up here. And this is when you can really pull off the business of just blobs in the sky. This is blobs is for, was it Michelle who was worried about her blobs? Well, here, this is blob time to advantage. To great advantage, you can put all the blobs you want with that little flock of birds flying around there. Uh, now then... Um, I've got some snow. The snow was, was, uh, is, is lying about on these little shorelines at Gibbs Pond. And the snow, of course, is, a, is a very interpretive and it's also very nice to know that you can just put a, uh, a couple of strokes full of um, white paint and uh, lo, voila, you have snow. But you've got land underneath it. Uh, that's a little, it should be a little bit darker than that, so I'm going to use some, some Indian red and a touch of this leftover darkish green to make the land a little bit darker to receive the snow on top of it. Uh, so I, I, I do everything and try to make it according to some kind of a plan. And so here's that land sticking out into the pond, and then we're going to put, I'm going to lay the snow on top of it with the same kind of technique that I used for the reflections in the water. So here's a little bit of snow running up from the, from the shoreline. In, uh, and of course, when you look at it very close, you say, oh, that is the most god-awful mess I have ever seen. But I do believe when you step back from it, it, uh, it seems to gain some kind of uh, um, realism and a little bit of, um, a little bit of comprehension along with the, uh, along with the blobs. Uh, that is one of the things about the interpretation of this, of the, of this um, technique, is to be able to differentiate between the incomprehensible blobs and the ones that mean something. So I'm mixing up some darker tone. Oh, I got a call. Okay, let's have a call. Who is this, please? Uh, my name is Fred. Hello, Fred. Good evening. Good my evening. Wife, my wife and I do enjoy uh, watching your show. Wonderful. And uh, several weeks ago, you mentioned that you uh, had a friend that, uh, with a dog and that you planned at uh, some future t uh, date uh, painting the, the dog. It was a loss, I believe you mentioned. That's right. You've got some memory, and boy, do you pay attention. <laughs> wow. Uh, we thought it was going to be painted on the last uh, Tuesday in February. Well, That's, you, would, you would mention that particular date. I tell you why. The dog is at this moment uh, coming over because there was a car problem with the owner. And the owner has told me that next time, at the end of this month, the little dog, the, whose name I believe is Tina. Tina will be here in person next week to pose for us. Oh, wonderful. And Tina also needed a lap. And the person who had the lap that Tina was going to sit on in order to sit still was unable to come. So, uh, uh, Fred, you said your name was? Yes. Well, Fred, I think that Tina would be more than flattered if she knew that you were awaiting her presence. <laughs> but uh, there was a car problem. Okay. And so we'll forgive them. But please, uh, as, long as, you have, as long as you are waiting for that, we will, we will make sure that Tina is available without fail on the last Tuesday of um, March. All right, thank you. We'll be looking forward to that. Thank you for calling. Do enjoy your show. Thank you very kindly. Thank you. All right, so we, uh, we now are making appointments with doggies. Uh, very important if we have made a promise that we keep it. But uh, there was, in fact, that in fact is not a, a last-minute excuse. It is the actual truth. I was told that earlier today. I said, where is where's the little Laza? And I was told about the, um, about the um, problem with the car. So... Um, let's see, we're, 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 we're getting along to, towards the end of this program, and a lot of nice calls. I'm, I'm so pleased when people uh, take the time and the bother to call me up and talk to me and tell me about it. Uh, my show, uh, this show won an award last year for the Hometown USA Video Festival, and uh, naturally every time we go on the air we try to produce something that's going to be able to be submitted for another you know, another award uh, thing, and hopefully we'll get better and better, and the people that make it better is not me and the crew, but it's you guys out there that can call me up and tell me what you think of the show and what I'm doing and what, what we can do to make it better. This
this is the foreground, which is, um, I'm preparing it to receive blobs of snow as we, uh, so all of this putting on this dark uh, material here might seem incomprehensible, but that's the way painting is. If you, if you, if you don't prepare it, uh, the final effect is not possible. So all of this darkness in the foreground is being done for the same reason that the background of the sky was done, so that you can work over it. Uh, I believe also that um, the, uh, for some reason which I am not willing to try to explain, the, the water in the foreground here is quite dark and has a purplish tone to it, uh, which is one of the things that I talk about when I'm talking about working from life. Um, that when you see something which is so mysterious, that's the only time you can get it, is when you're working from life. I think there's another call? Okay. Let's take the other call, please. Yes, hello? Yes, hello. You're a fat tubby... Ah, we had somebody who was, um, who was going to be insulting, but, uh, apparently he was, he was cut off before he was able to do that. Uh, is that, is that what happened? Oh, okay. Well, you know, I mean, the world is full of, um, people who... If you find it necessary to do that, it doesn't worry me very much. Um, the wonderful calls make up for all the people who don't have wonderful calls to make. Um, the darkness of the water as it uh, comes towards the shoreline is, mm, well, it's there, and it affords for a nice variety, again, in this uh, color scheme of blue. I, the blue may be a little bit intense. I'm not sure if this blue is, is too intense. Working in such a, you know, in such uh, limited time makes you think that maybe the color could have been a little bit more carefully uh, mixed. However, I think that the technique is the more important thing to demonstrate here rather than a verisimilitude of color. So, uh, you know, just to observe that the, that the water near this shoreline is quite dark and that it becomes less dark in the middle. The swan, for some reason or another, did not have a reflection over there, but the swan now seems to have a reflection, so I'm going to cheat and put the reflection on this here, one over here, and see if we can't make that uh, sort of, well, do what it's supposed to do. Now, this has to be a mirror image. Therefore, it has to come out and, as best we can, make it appear to be a mirror image of the, um, of the bird. Okay, a little bit, it doesn't have to be actually uh, as, as clearly identified as the bird because it is, after all, fooling around on water. And all you need really is a suggestion of what's happening. I'm not sure that that works, but uh, let's curve the head. Maybe that'll work a little bit better. Anyway, I wanna get some, I wanna get some snow on the, uh, some snow on the beach. And uh, by doing that, I'm just gonna pull the, I'm gonna pull the, the palette knife over with little light strokes and kind of hit and miss as I go, uh, because that that's the impression that I get that that snow is doing that. Uh, blown by the wind, I suppose, or that that's the way it happened to fall, or there are hummocks and bumps and little holes on that shoreline which are giving it the, the uh, which are giving the snow this particular texture. The uh, fact that I'm using this quick drying paint means that the paint that I put on is not dry exactly, but it is dry enough to be able to pull a palette knife across here to give the illusion that there is in fact snow. And, it, and there are rocks along the, the shoreline which can in fact just be daubed on, but the snow is the important thing to pull it across. Well, you know, there is um, there's a tremendous amount to be said for this very, very interpretive technique. I have done it for years and years and years, almost as a vacation from the discipline of the brushwork. The brushwork is extremely, well, one must, one must really have a tremendous technique and a lot of years of experience before you, you can uh, do a, uh, a landscape painting in brush style and be totally satisfied with it. So I, I find myself uh, very relieved to be able to pick up a palette knife and become much freer. And I find that, I've, that I really like the knife uh, very much a good deal of the time. This duck is not going to appreciate what I'm doing to it, but, uh, you know, the duck hour doesn't matter. We managed to do the whole pond. And he has a shadow underneath him, which means that he's not floating in midair. Let's just put the shadow beneath him. Is that, is that duck sitting with a shadow? There's a shadow, fine. Okay, well, you know, we do what we can. And uh, somewhere along the line, this is supposed to be 
uh, an interpretation of Gibbs Pond. It's actually a very uh, limited palette, is what this is called, that Duck has now stood up. Uh, and I did not get him standing. Well, to heck with you, Duck. I'm not going to put you in now. I have no time. But limited palette meaning that there is introduction of virtually no roses, no reds, no greens, uh, just these blues, these muted kind of nothing tones, the amber colors, the whites, and the blue of the pond, and of course, the blue of the, of the, of the ducks. Um, I hope that this uh, technique uh, interests you as much as it does me. I appreciate your watching. I love the phone calls, and uh, I'll, I will see and talk to you at the end of March uh, in the next live program. This is Patricia Windrow at the Cable Easel thanking you for watching and bidding you bye-bye. <laughs>